hypertensive disorders in pregnancy is a topic guaranteed to be seen on your ob shelf and your step 2 CK exam. So let's focus on mastering some high yield concepts about this topic. So to get a general overview of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, let's take a look at this graph. It's going to be a simplified way for you to remember them. So on this graph, 20 weeks means 20 weeks gestation, okay? So let's get started. So chronic hypertension, this occurs at less than 20 weeks and the name kind of tells us what it's about. It's hypertension and hypertension is a chronic disorder and that's seen in a lot of people in the general population and it's not specific to only pregnant women. It's when the systolic blood pressure is greater than 140 and or the diastolic blood pressure is greater than 90 prior to conception. The other hypertensive disorders that occur in pregnancy happen after 20 weeks gestation. These include gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and eclampsia. So now let's take a closer look at the hypertensive disorders in pregnancy that occur after 20 weeks gestation. So gestational hypertension is new onset elevated blood pressure at greater than 20 weeks gestation. There is no proteinuria and no end organ damage. However, this is different in preeclampsia. So in preeclampsia, it also includes new onset elevated blood pressure at greater than 20 weeks gestation. However, it also includes proteinuria or end organ damage. So hopefully this visual will help you to remember the differences between gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. Now let's kind of compare preeclampsia and eclampsia. Like we previously discussed, preeclampsia includes proteinuria or end organ damage, and of course, new onset elevated blood pressure at greater than 20 weeks. Eclampsia also occurs at greater than 20 weeks and includes new onset elevated blood pressure. However, the key difference is that in eclampsia, these patients have new onset grand mal seizures. This is extremely high yield. So I really, really hope that this visual will help you to remember the key differences between preeclampsia and eclampsia. Now let's look at another hypertensive disorder in pregnancy that might show up on your exam. And that is chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia. So the name of this disorder kind of tells you what's going on. But well, let's look at a visual for this so you can remember it better. To diagnose a patient with this, they must have chronic hypertension. They should also have one of the following, well, at least one of the following, and that includes new elevated or worsening blood pressures and two worsening proteinuria or signs of end organ damage. So here is a summary of everything we talked about. All these conditions include elevated blood pressures. However, chronic hypertension occurs at less than 20 weeks gestation, while the others occur after 20 weeks gestation. So when you think about it, chronic hypertension and gestational hypertension are the same except for their timing. So as the name suggests, in gestational hypertension, their elevated blood pressures occur at greater than 20 weeks gestation, while in chronic hypertension, it's a chronic disorder. So preeclampsia is like a step up from gestational hypertension in that there is also elevated blood pressure, but they can also experience proteinuria or end organ damage. 
and eclampsia is basically preeclampsia with seizures. So chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia is exactly what the name says. These patients have to have chronic hypertension and sudden worsening elevated blood pressures or new onset or worsening proteinuria or signs of end organ damage. There are many complications for hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, but let's classify them into maternal and fetal complications. Maternal complications include postpartum hemorrhage, gestational diabetes, placental abruption, and c-sections however fetal complications include fetal growth restriction preterm delivery oligohydramnios and perinatal mortality so it's very important for us to be able to identify types of hypertensive disorders and know how to treat them so we can prevent or minimize these complications. Now let's take a closer look at preeclampsia to score even more points on your exam. So what are risk factors for preeclampsia? Well, these can be divided into two groups. The first group being risk factors related to parity and gravidity. And then the second group relating to historical or non-modifiable risk factors. So these are multiple gestation or nulliparity, chronic kidney disease, diabetes mellitus, advanced maternal age, and prior eclampsia. It's extremely high yield to note that the prophylactic treatment for preeclampsia is low dose aspirin at 12 weeks. Aspirin is given to patients with a high risk of preeclampsia. So it's very important that we know severe symptoms or clinical features of preeclampsia. This can be identified by systolic blood pressure greater than 160 or diastolic blood pressure greater than 90 at greater than 20 weeks gestation and abnormal lab findings or visual symptoms. So these abnormal lab findings include elevated creatinine, elevated transaminases, a platelet count less than 100,000, or even pulmonary edema. So the management of preeclampsia is dependent on the gestational age and the presence or absence of severe features. So if there are no severe features and greater than 37 weeks gestation, then the treatment is delivery. If there are severe features present and greater than 34 weeks, again, the treatment is delivery. If there are severe features and greater than 37 weeks, you guessed it, the treatment is delivery. For patients that have severely elevated blood pressures, antihypertensives are also used to manage them. Magnesium sulfate can also be used to prevent the development of eclampsia. We can remember which antihypertensives are safe to use in these patients with the mnemonic hypertensive moms love nifedipine. So we can give them IV hydralazine, IV labetalol, or PO nifedipine. So we just discussed antihypertensives and more specifically hypertensive moms love nifedipine. But it's so important that we remember that ACE inhibitors and ARBs are teratogens. So these drugs should be avoided in pregnant women. 
If you would like a flashcard video talking about some high yield teratogens that are commonly tested, please let me know in the comments below. Okay, so we looked at eclampsia, the risk factors, and the management, and even the clinical features of severe preeclampsia. So now let's look at eclampsia. And remember that eclampsia is defined as preeclampsia and grand mal seizures. So of course, the clinical features for eclampsia are hypertension, seizures, as well as visual symptoms, headaches, right upper quadrant, or epigastric pain. Management for these patients include magnesium sulfate. However, if patients are refractory to this, then we can give them diazepam or phenytoin. Of course, we have to manage their elevated blood pressure with antihypertensives, and the definitive management for these patients is delivery. So we just mentioned magnesium sulfate quite a bit in the management of patients with preeclampsia and eclampsia. But what are some indications for magnesium sulfate? These include prevention of eclamptic seizures and in the management of imminent preterm delivery. It is giving to mothers who will have preterm delivery because it lowers the risk of cerebral palsy in premature infants. It's important to note that magnesium is cleared by the kidneys. So patients with pre-existing kidney problems or an elevated creatinine may need a lower dose and very close observation because they have an increased risk of magnesium toxicity. Now let's look at the clinical features of this magnesium toxicity. So the first sign is hyporeflexia. Other initial signs include nausea, vomiting, headaches, flushing, areflexia, and hypocalcemia. But late and lethal clinical features of magnesium toxicity include respiratory distress and cardiac arrest. So how can we treat patients with magnesium toxicity? We have to, of course, discontinue magnesium therapy. We also need to administer IV calcium gluconate. It is given to prevent cardiac arrest and to reverse neuromuscular paralysis. Now let's highlight some high yield points about hypertensive disorders in pregnancy by doing a quick quiz. Question number one. What is the most important risk factor for preeclampsia? Hmm, let's think about it. Let's go. And that is a previous history of preeclampsia. Question number two. What is the first sign of magnesium toxicity? That is hyporeflexia. This is very high yield to note because if you see a clinical vignette where a mother has a hypertensive disorder in pregnancy, but then they develop hyporeflexia, nausea and vomiting, we need to be very, very suspicious of magnesium toxicity. Okay, that brings us to the end of this video. If you liked this content, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe and that notification bell. As always, thank you for watching and to continue learning more, click this video right here.